Hello and welcome to the update program. I'm Michael David and my guest today is Candace Smith. She's an etiquette educator and etiquette blogger. Candace, thanks for being on the update program today. It's my pleasure, Mike. Now, uh, one day I know the, Web- the Merriam-Webster Dictionary Online featured the word of the day as etiquette. And what was their definition of that? The definition is the conduct or procedure, and I'm quoting, required by good breeding or prescribed by authority to be observed in social or official life. Now, that definition might be a little bit outdated. So what would you say is a good working definition of etiquette in the 21st century? That's a great question. I'm going to give you my short answer first. My short answer is to show up the art of showing up recognizably respectful. And that means that you are aiming for self-command, meaning you choose, you choose etiquette. My longer working definition is the mindful, personal, and intentional practice of creating respectful, kind, orderly interactions within your family, social, professional, educational, neighborly, and public environments in all communities. Now, that is a very broad brush you just painted with, Candace. So let me see if I can cut it down to something small, okay? Maybe something each of us do each week, okay? Let's talk about the working lunch, okay? What would you say if we're just in the break room with our coworkers, maybe they're bringing their own lunches or maybe they're having their food delivered? In a situation like that, would we have different rules than the manners we would use if we were in a fine dining scenario, like at a five-star restaurant? The answer is yes, Mike. I think it's the same, just like manners in a five-star restaurant, except for the place settings. Everything is the same. You're going to show up in gratitude, welcome your, your host or your coworkers. You're, if it's a business lunch and your boss is there, you're going to wait for him to signal that everyone should be seated. If it's a more informal environment, you're still mindful of your space. If you're bringing food, your own lunch, you don't just sit down and dig in. You, in a kind and respectful way, take out your own food quietly. You wait for others. It's the same. Interesting. Now, in most gatherings where people are eating, we tend to make food the primary subject. But when business is being conducted during mealtime, business should be the primary subject, I would guess. But... What do we do in a situation like that if we are exceptionally hungry? Well, first of all, it is about the food. When you're at a friend's home, you've been invited for dinner at a home, it is about the food because you're celebrating being there and you're honoring your host or hostess. It is about the food. It's about recognizing that someone else prepared it for you. But when you are having a lunch at work and you're bringing your food or food has been brought in for you, it's been ordered, it's not about the food. Because if you make it about the food, you're chomping down and it is not about the food then. Now, what are some other points to remember for working lunches and other mealtime meetings? Well, it is about the business, as you mentioned. If you're having a business meeting over lunch, and it may be, again, that you've had food brought in or that You have your own lunch, and you bring it, and you take it out in a mindful way. But you have to be aware that other people are beside you, and they can hear you. So observing little things like don't smack, don't chow down your food, don't lick your fingers, don't be distractive with your food. It's very important at any lunch. Don't lick your fingers even if you're at lunch by yourself? What about that? (laughs) Well, sometimes if you're standing in your kitchen and you're just feeding, it's quite okay not to have manners. I'm sure you can just chow down all you want and make it all about the food. But when you're with others, being mindful that having food can be very, very distracting, and yet everyone wants to have a nutritious meal, just eating slow, being conversational. And if you're really, really hungry and you're having a business meeting, with your employer, and with others. It may be that you might want to have a little snack or two before you came, mid-morning or mid-afternoon, but it should never be a chow down. Good information. Now, what are some guidelines to keep in mind when we're supplying our own working lunch? 
Some things to remember always is if you're having, a, for example, a lunch presentation and food has been served, you wait until everyone is served before you begin eating. And if you're eating during a presentation, because perhaps you're having a presentation, don't decide you're going to clean up your space then and there. Let the presentation end. Don't make it about the food. Remember to maintain a good posture and stay alert for moments that require your participation. Eat quietly with your mouth closed. Take small bites. And bring food if you're bringing it or if you're getting food from a buffet, for example, and food has been provided. Make sure you don't have your plate loaded up. Again, that's making it all about the food. There's not time for conversation. One other thing, too, is if you do have a lunch and potato chip bags are there, for example, try to not crinkle them. Try to be quiet in your own space. Now, Candace, what does the Bible teach us about etiquette? Well, one thing I know from 1 Corinthians 14, 40, but all things should be done decently and in order. And I want to say, too, there's a Very cool article, Mike. It's called What the Bible Says About Etiquette and Manners. And the author says that, and I agree completely with her, etiquette is more than fussy rules laid down by stuffy people. Etiquette is the oil that lubricates society and reduces the friction of interpersonal relationships. When we view etiquette as a means by which we earn the right To speak into people's lives, we become more sensitive to the way we present ourselves. We see our behaviors, and and this is from table manners to telling jokes or being humorous, as instruments to either attract or distance others. And Jesus is our model. He came to earth and took on our dress, customs, and manners in order to lead us to God. As his followers... We should see etiquette as a way to follow in his footsteps. Now, Candace, what do we do if we find ourselves in the company of someone who simply can't just disagree with us and let it go? And as a result, they create an uncomfortable situation. In situations like that, and hopefully, again, it's not around eating or any kind of food because our bodies need to have peaceful, relaxing, civil environments when we're eating. But if it's any time and you find yourself in a situation where someone is just simply not helping the conversation, it's usually because the person not only disagrees with what you're saying, it perhaps it's a religious belief or a political belief, but they also don't think you are a good person. When those two things come together, you have a very uncomfortable situation. Now, what are if you will, skills, if you will, that we can use in a civil conversation that can help us be ready for or help diffuse the situation that becomes a, an explosive situation. When you're etiquetteful, it means that you're willing to soften the edges, the rough edges of a conversation by staying away from strong feelings. And I think that If you focus on listening, listening to understand, for example, if you focus on encouraging yourself to be curious about what the other person is really saying, that really helps. Also using I statements when you're talking about your view on a particular subject. For example, I think that is a much better statement than you or we should or we come up with the shoulds. But looking for a common ground in any conversation is always important. And sometimes when things are getting a little rough, maybe maybe it's a situation you realize, oh, I, maybe I shouldn't be in this conversation. You need to back off a little bit. Just, again, soften the edges a little bit. And you can say something like, um, Corey, uh, I see your point and your concern. I really do. But I also know that right now we probably can't agree on this subject, so let's just not worry about it and move on to another subject. You can change the topic. Now, does this mean that we always have to agree with people we interact with? Well, every disagreement, if you you might have a disagreement with someone and you've agreed to disagree, and it's important to remember that every disagreement 
doesn't have to end with a win. Because agreeing to disagree means to live and let live. Some of the things you say are mentioned casually, but someone takes offense at it. And when you see that happening, just back off and let the conversation move in a, in a different direction. But the most important thing is to acknowledge that the other person might be right. You could say, for example, Sarah, you might be right, but I do prefer to stick to my opinion right now. Could we just agree to disagree on this and maybe talk about something fun? I really want to hear about your trip to Italy. All right. Now, sometimes as we're dealing with people, we may say something that uh, maybe have been maybe is out of line, and uh, maybe we need to apologize. So when do we actually need to say we're sorry, and can an apology actually be a relationship tool? I think we all know that it's very important to, to apologize for mistakes we've made, and the quicker, the better. When we say I'm sorry, these are really, they're truly magic words. And when you say them simply and directly, you open the door to peace. So I think of an apology as a relationship tool. These two words, I'm sorry, help me, help you take responsibility for our own actions, and they imply the true desire to reestablish and rebuild trust. Now, how do we know when we are actually ready to apologize, and how do we know when we're not ready to apologize? I think when we're not ready to apologize, we're saying things like, John, I'm really sorry, but I think that's a major signal that we're not ready. When the emotion is still there, and you're feeling the resentment in your body, we're not ready to say we're sorry. When we're ready to say we're sorry we realize that we've made a mistake. We realize we have caused harm. We realize that we're sad, and that's the time to say, I'm really, so- I'm really sorry. That's a, be- that's a place for beginning. That's, a- that's the place for it all to begin. And the sooner you can say it, the better. If you're just joining us, you're listening to the Update program. I'm Michael David in studio with my guest, Candace Smith. She's an etiquette educator and etiquette blogger. I'll ask you this at the end of the program as well, Candace, but can you give a website where people can go if they want to get more information about you? Yes. You can visit my website at Candace Smith Etiquette. It'll come up on your screen as clearing up etiquette confusion because my goal is to explore how the rules of etiquette can become personal guidelines for living courteously in our civil world, professionally and personally. You can also visit the Etiquette blog by Candace Smith Etiquette. That'll come right up when you Google it. And the goal of my blog is it's dedicated to the quest for civility in this modern world. And the goal of each article is to answer etiquette questions on table manners, social life, your professional work environment, and more. And you can subscribe when you go to that site, the Etiquette Blog by Candace Smith Etiquette. You can subscribe and get the Etiquette Blogs each week. They come out every Friday. And I also think you teach classes. Is that right, Candace? Yes, I do. My, my students are primarily students at business schools, universities, and any organization that asks asks me to come and teach their students. I primarily teach high school and university-aged students. Moving on with our social etiquette skills, what should we do if we're invited to a social event? How can we be a good guest? The very first thing, the most important thing, is that RSVP. Handle it as soon as possible. Don't let that lag because someone else is preparing something for you. Someone else is preparing an event and they need a head count. They need, if they're, if, if you've ever, and I'm sure you have hosted something for someone and you have these stragglers, people who just aren't RSVPing, that is a major, that's a major thing that you need to, to do to make sure that everything will go well. Also, I think it's really important to realize that you don't get to bring tag along guests If someone's invited you, 
You may need to make sure that it's you that's coming. It's not proper to ask someone if you can bring someone else, especially after the event's been planned. If it's an evening dinner, you're going to uh, your host's for dinner, and perhaps there's a reception, it's wonderful if you bring the host a small gift. Often flowers are good to bring, but lately I've been cautioning people that flowers really aren't a good thing. If you've ever experienced having a dinner and people are bringing you flowers, you feel obligated to put the flowers in a vase, in a vase, and then you're busy doing that and not getting the dinner going so other little gifts are are appropriate. It's very important that you don't hang, if you're invited to a home, that you're not in the kitchen mingling with the cook if she's in there cooking or if he's in there cooking. Be appropriate with where you're mingling and allow the host to kind of direct you to where you're where you're supposed to go. Also, be sure you don't overstay your welcome. When the dinner's over, you re- realize the host will be cleaning up, so be mindful. Just pay attention to when there are signals that, oh, it's really time to go. Because your host will never say, she'll never say, well, John, it's time to go. So everything has to come to an end. You leave, and then the very next thing you do the next day is that you write a thank you note. It's very important to handwrite a thank you note if you've gone to someone's house for dinner. Once we have been invited to a social event, should we return the invitation Yes, it doesn't need to be returned right away. And some things some things you get invited to, you wouldn't return the invitation. For example, you may be invited to a, a company dinner. There, So there are some things you wouldn't reciprocate with. But if you're invited to a dinner or a lunch and it's a, it's a social occasion, then those things do need to be reciprocated because relationships build on reciprocity. If I invite you to dinner, then... You might invite me to breakfast or lunch, or perhaps in your your home you don't have room to invite me to dinner, but you can reciprocate by inviting me somewhere else. Now, at those social events, what happens if we meet somebody and uh, we end up talking to someone with whom we have absolutely nothing in common? My response to that question, Mike, is how do you know you don't have anything in common? You really don't know until you talk to someone else. If you're in an event and someone else is there and you don't know that person, the greatest tool that we have to use is what's called small talk. Because small talk means we're going to be engaging with someone else over topics that are light. They're not heavy. You don't want to have a heavy conversation at a gathering where you're at a reception event. Having a heavy conversation is not what you want. So you want to skim the surface of things. So you you can come prepared. Some people are very uncomfortable at those kinds of events, and I always advise them to carry in their pocket or their handbag a note card that they on which they've written key questions they might ask for that particular event. They would vary for different events. So you're prepared, you know what the event's about, you generally know who's going to be there, what kinds of folks are going to be there, in other words, what their occupations might be. So you'll have a sense of who you might meet. And those little topics that you write on that card can be very helpful. It's not that you whip the card out and and read oh, here's my sixth conversation topic. It's that you've written them down. They're in your bag, and you can easily, if you're stuck and you don't know exactly what to say, you can reference one of those topics. A good one for many many places is uh, refers to to a sports team because so many people are interested in sports. Now, as we're in those conversations, how can we avoid the perception of being someone who is performing a duty rather than an authentic person who is actually interested in getting to know someone? That's a really critical, important question, and it's a question that almost all, almost every group of students that I teach ask. They say, how can, I don't want to come across as rude, but how do, I'm not really that interested, and I'm just there going through the motions. And my comment is, why are you only going through the motions? You're showing up and you're going to intentionally listen. So it's very important to have the 
that you know the reason why you're going to an event. It's very important that you ask yourself, why am I here? Why am I going to this? It's always going to have some kind of an answer about getting to be with other people. So you're going to be mingling. And when you're mingling, if you're not authentically committed to listening, you will come across as the person who's not listening. So you can make a choice. You can choose to say to yourself, I'm really going to listen. And sometimes that's hard because sometimes when we're, quote, listening, unquote, what we're really doing is getting ready to say what we want to say. In other words, we're just waiting for to get in something about us. And that's not being particularly mindful, is it? What are some good tips for being a good listener? Number one, that you intend to listen. And when you're listening, you watch yourself, observe yourself, and check yourself. Am I listening? You attend to the subject at hand. Establishing good eye contact is really important. I don't mean staring at another person because when you're looking at someone, to keep your eyes focused on them as they're conversing helps you and helps them. But again, never stare. If someone's talking intently, you can say something like yes or indicate that you're listening. The most important thing that you can do when you're listening to someone is to really attend to them. And again, I mentioned that that comes from having the intention to live and listen. You really need to intend to listen. If you intend to show up and do something else, you will be regarded as someone perhaps, who isn't genuinely there as an authentic person. So when you're attending to someone, what you're really doing is showing that person by your body posture, you're facing that person, you're looking them, you're looking at them in the eyes, you're intending to listen to them, you're listening to hear what it is they're having to say, and that feeling is generated. It's I don't even think it's something that it's, well, it is something that's very unconscious. Another person knows when you're listening to them. Your whole, your body, your body posture, your eye contact, it shows that you're listening. Listen intently and see what you can learn. And then chances are there'll be a question there that's just laying like a gem to ask the other person to take them a little bit deeper into what they're saying. Now, as we're talking to people and listening to them, sometimes... Personal information is shared. It's confidential. Um, How can we know when and when not to share that confidential information? Usually when you're sharing information with someone or someone's talking with you, and if that person is maybe quiet, the tone of voice goes down, maybe there's a little whisper, or if the person says, you know, I really hope that you don't share this information. The intentions are stated up front. Sometimes they're not. But if the if the information the person is sharing is very is personal, that's a clear signal that that person doesn't want it shared. And it's always nice to say to someone, Sharon, I'll keep this information confidential, of course. And then the conversation can slide on into something else. And the person is grateful, knowing that, in fact, that person may have shared something she didn't intend to share, but... You're graciously there for her and letting her know you won't share that information. Now, what happens if we share the confidential information and our friend or our coworker doesn't respect it as confidential as it should be? That's a very important question because that does happen to all of us. And rather than a, attack the other person or show emotion around what's happened, you need to take some time by yourself to kind of mull it over and think, What just happened? And be really clear in your mind what it is that happened that you're not happy with. And then it's not too hard to make an appointment with a person and say, "Uh, Jill, do you have a few minutes a little bit later? There's something that's bothering me and I'd like to share it with you. And perhaps Jill might say, well, share it now and no one's there. And you can say, you know, you shared something with John yesterday and and or in the group of people, and I wasn't ready to have that information out there. And I want to let you know that that really bothered me. So it's very important that you speak up. It's very important that you don't harbor those ill feelings. Now, what happens if I'm talking to somebody and I get a text message? 
Should I stop talking to them and check my text message, or should I wait until later? Absolutely not. Do not do not respond to your text message, ever, because you're disregarding the person you're with. That person is talking to you, and here you get a text message. Suddenly, that person is no longer important. Well, Candace, you've given me a lot to work on, so I'll definitely uh, get on that. And uh, also, I think we've just scratched the surface today. Um, is there a web, again, can you give the website where people can get more information about you on tips that we can improve our etiquette skills with? Yes, CandaceSmithEtiquette.com. It'll come up as Confused by Etiquette Rules. And you can also be in touch with me through the Etiquette blog and I would love to have people subscribed, subscribe to that website. And also have you come out and teach classes at their school or at their business, yes? Yes, I would love that. Thank you. All right, CandiceSmithEtiquette.com. Uh, Candice, thank you for being on the update program today. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate being here. You've been listening to the update program. My guest has been Candace Smith. She's an etiquette educator and etiquette blogger. You can learn more about her at Candace Smith Etiquette. The views and opinions expressed on Update do not necessarily reflect those of management, sponsors, ownership, or staff of this station. We welcome your thoughts. Send them to Update Program, 3000 West MacArthur Boulevard, Suite 500, Santa Ana, California, 92704. Thank you for listening, and God bless.